So for question one, group four told us that um, first they tried to find an online summary and they found one, but even the summary was hard to understand. So then they had to dive into the essay, maybe try using Google Translate to, to try to understand it better. But there were some parts that Google Translate could not handle either. So then they had to go to a dictionary, but a dictionary gives many meanings for the same word, and they did not understand enough about the essay to choose a good meaning. So then they tried to look at if there are some parts that are easier to understand, and there were usually when uh, people and stories were mentioned. But then they had a hard time trying to put together those parts and make sense of the other parts. So in the end, uh, this, the strategy that they chose was to come to class and see what the teacher says. Um, and I think this probably is the experience that most of you had when reading this essay. Um, and so this tells us a few things. First, that um, reading and understanding something is not just about understanding the words and the grammar. You have to have a broader understanding of what is going on, what does the author try to say, why does this essay exist? Now, for anything that you would want to read in your own life, this probably would not be a problem. You would want to read something because you're interested in that thing. But in this class, you want to read this because I asked you to read it. So there's no necessary connection between what you already understand and what this essay is trying to say. Um, so like when you're trying to understand something or when you're trying to learn English, improve your English, um, always try to look for that connection, for that understanding, um, that personal connection. If you just open a random textbook and try to learn that way, it won't work very well. Follow what you are interested in. And the second thing we can learn from this story is if you have questions, find a teacher or find someone who maybe knows the answer. Um, the students in group four today were very smart because they did not give up the chance to come to class and see what the teacher uh, explains. But if you're studying on your own, it might take more effort to find somebody that you can ask questions to but it's always worth that effort. Um, so as we talk about the next four questions, you can see how well the discussion matches what you were able to guess from your own reading. And you can see uh, how you might be able to close the gap between these two. Let's take a short break.
OK, so we're talking about question two. And group five says that uh, the examples here are all examples of misogyny. And uh, they give some good reasons. Let's go to. 151 and look at it together. So here the author gives two examples where DFW says something about women and uh, group five says that both of these examples show that DFW is misogynistic here. So the first one is when he describes the New York Times book reviewer as a very charming Japanese lady from the New York Times. And group five says that this is misogynistic because the point that the reviewer makes is not related to the fact that she's a woman. So instead of responding to her ideas, DFW is pointing out that she's a woman, even though it's not related to what they're talking about. So he seems to be implying that we should take this book reviewer less seriously because she's a woman, right? And he even says that she's a very charming Japanese lady, not just a lady, but a very charming lady. It seems to be implying that uh, she's uh, attractive, charming, but maybe not smart, right? He's drawing attention to other aspects of uh, the reviewer that are unrelated to her job. Uh, and so group five thinks that this is a misogynistic way to talk about her. On the next page, uh, the other example is uh, he, DFW is talking about his girlfriend. And he says she's not in the business, so she's not in like the literature business. She's not a writer. So I'm worried I'm going to have to explain intentional fallacy to her. That this is not in fact me talking. So. Uh, for the moment, we don't have to worry about what intentional fallacy means. But the idea seems to be, as group five points out, that because she is not a professional, she may not understand this idea. And he's worried that he'll have to explain it to her. And of course, that's not true, right? Just because you're not a professional, uh, you might still understand something. That's uh, that assumption is kind of weird, but it's even more weird when we understand what the intentional fallacy is. The intentional fallacy is the so the word fallacy means mistake. So the intentional fallacy is the mistake of thinking that what you read is what the author believes. Especially because DFW is writing fiction. Uh, this assumption seems to be very naive. Like when you read a novel or when you watch a movie, would you think that what the characters are saying is what the author believes? Usually not, right? Like there, it's fiction for a reason. These are characters for a reason. And yet DFW worries that his girlfriend does not understand this. He worries that his girlfriend will think that his characters are actually himself, that everything his characters say are things that he himself believes. It's a very simple concept, but he's worried that his girlfriend doesn't understand this simply because she's not a writer. To me and to group five, that seems to assume that his girlfriend is not very smart. And so the fact that he thinks this is quite misogynistic. Yeah. 
OK, thank you, group five. Other groups, do you want to add ideas to this question? OK, let's move on to question three. Group one, how can you tell that this is an academic essay and not a popular essay? Are there some clues, some places where you can see a difference? So group one pointed out something very interesting on page. What page is it? 160. Uh, where am I? 153. Page 160 after the quote uh, in the last paragraph. Um, in this part of the essay, she's talking about how, why she began to write this essay uh, and why it is an academic essay and not a popular essay. And the reason is because the editor of the popular essay wanted her to read some DFW in order to um, add to her argument, and she didn't want to do that. And the reason she could refuse is because the scholar in this case had tenure. Tenure means uh, that she cannot be fired unless for a serious reason. In Chinese, we call this zong sen zi. And because she did not, in a professional sense, need to publish the essay, she could, without significant cost, choose to resist the engine of canonization. So she did not need to publish that popular essay. She is not a popular writer. She is an academic writer, so she could refuse to follow the editor's advice. Group one wants us to pay attention to the fact that she in this sentence, she's talking about herself. When she says the scholar in this case, she's talking about herself. When she says she did not need to publish the essay, she's talking about herself. And this is something you would often find in academic writing. When you, when the author refers to themselves, they try not to use the word I. They might say the author. They might say uh, this scholar. In Chinese, uh, they would say bizi instead of wo. So that's one clue. And also here she calls herself a scholar, right? She's not, she doesn't call herself a writer. Uh, so it makes sense to assume that a scholar would write something that is academic. Um, so that's what group one found. But we also have some other clues. I think the, the clue that is probably the most noticeable is the fact that it has notes. Uh, in this case, end notes. We have read four essays now. 
the first essay had, I think, one footnote. Uh, but the middle two essays had none, and those middle two essays were personal essays. Um, whereas the first essay was a report in a psychology study, so that's also academic. Most essays, most popular essays don't have notes. Some do, but most don't. And in fact, because it has notes, um, I also included those notes in your handout. If you go to the very end of your handout, the last, I think, two pages. No, more than two pages. The last four pages are notes. Um, so if you're interested to see what she put in her notes, you can go to the end of your handout and check that out. So that's another clue that this is an academic essay. Um, during the general discussion, I also heard some people say like, uh, oh, the, the vocabulary is very difficult or like the grammar is very hard. But actually, um, for an academic essay, it's not that hard. It's OK. It's kind of for, in terms of an academic essay, it's kind of easy. Um, but you can also pay attention to what she talks about. Um, here in this paragraph, when she's describing uh, why she wrote this essay at first, she says uh, the editor saw this as publishing a negative piece on Wallace. And that um, so because uh, the editor thinks that it's a piece about the author only, so he recommends uh, the author of the essay to read more DFW. So it looks like this essay began life. Um, about only DFW. But today the essay that we are reading is about much more than one author. Right? She talks about uh, her own process to decide not to read more of his work. She talks about how different people um, have this kind of process of making DFW into an, an important author that everybody supposedly has to read. She talks about how there are so many things to read that a scholar of literature has to be careful and choose only those things that are worth uh, spending time to read uh, on. It's about much more than just one author. And I think that those extra parts are also uh, the academic parts of this essay. When you write, I say you, when one writes an academic paper, uh, we try to answer the main question. But in answering that question, we also try to explain everything about that question. So if I write an essay about um, how you guys try and struggle to read this essay. If I write a popular essay, I might tell a story about Oh, I chose this essay for some reasons, and then I assigned it, and what happened during class, and then how did that affect our discussion? But if I were writing an academic essay, I would add um, the educational background of my students, uh, what kind of reading they usually do in their daily life, what are my own goals in assigning this essay, what do I want my students to learn from it, and uh, what this process can uh, tell us about um, teaching literature in this way. So it's not just the main question, it's also everything about this question. Um, that's one of the key signs that you're reading an academic essay. It's about so much more than just the one thing. OK, thank you, group one. Other groups, you want to add uh, ideas to this question? OK, let's move on to 
Question four, group two. Uh, in that discussion with her original editor, the editor says that she uh, that a personal antipathy is not enough. So the editor thinks that the, the author has a personal antipathy toward DFW, that she personally doesn't like him or his work. Group four, uh, group two, sorry. Uh, she has a personal antipathy toward uh, Foster Wallace's work uh, because I could tell that by the part that writes. For me, the most persuasive persuasive of reasons to be interested in Wallace right now is that as Jim Jameson's advisor, I would be in conversation with her and to be the best conversation partner I can my I can be my in the end require that I read Wallace's novel. So it indicates that indicates that oh it's not because uh, she dislikes Foster Wallace, it's because she has to read it uh, because of his conversation partner and students. This is the reason behind behind it. It's not that it's not because he personally dislikes it. It's because, uh, OK, so the first part of this question, you guys think that she does not have a personal antipathy because when she has a good reason, she will read him. And the good reason that she offers is if her student uh, is studying him and she needs to help guide her student. That's a good reason and she would therefore read DFW's work. Yeah, that's the reason, not the reason behind why she read it. If uh, her students doesn't uh, need to read it, she, she herself wouldn't read it. There's no reason for her to read it. Uh, she, to she, she told us the reason behind it, that she doesn't have any reason to read it. The only reason is because her students OK. Of peer pressure or peer pressure That's why. Work pressure, OK, yeah. Um, so let me try to organize this answer. This question is asking, do you think that she actively does not want to read him? And your answer is no, she just doesn't have a good reason to read him. OK, thank you. And uh, how can you tell is because of that paragraph. When she does have a good reason, she will read him. Right. So the next part of this question, we can flip this around. Why do you think her editor assumes that she does have a personal antipathy? Sure. So on page 160, Here, uh, the editor says to her, I do think for the essay to work as a convincing critique of Wallace and not just evidence of a personal antipathy, it needs to have more of a grounding in Wallace's writing. In other words, the editor thinks that she does have a personal antipathy toward him or his work. So why do you think her editor would believe this? I think it's uh, because that. Uh, the reason would be like uh, the answer will be here. The, the this machine of canonization asks people invested in literary capital to keep reading Wallace and keeps everyone talking about Wallace's work as if it had something important to say. In this case, about misogyny, 
Misogyny. 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 Misogyny.
So group three, what do you think? Okay, thank you. Group three thinks that the central question of this essay is for the author, is it worth her time to read more of DFW? And this question is important, as the author says, because there are so many things that she could read with her limited time. So she has to make a decision for herself. Should she spend that time reading more of DFW? And the way that she tries to answer this question is first, she thinks about what she has already read, and then she looks at what other people say about his work. Uh, and she finds that there seems to be some kind of connection. Uh, when she examines what other people say, some people say that DFW is important, you should read him, but when she really looks at their reasons, most people only say that he's important because they think other people will think that he's important or because like the publisher is trying to make him look important or because so many people are talking about him, therefore he must be important. And to the author, these are not good reasons. On the other hand, there is also evidence that maybe DFW's work is not that worth reading. And here she brings up a lot of personal details from his life. Uh, she mentions how as a younger man, he was violent, uh, had impulse control, behaved poorly towards girls and women. Uh, he was manic depressive, he was alcoholic, drug addiction, all of these things. And then she finds in one of his stories, 
uh, someone, a character who thinks about his readers in a similar way that DFW thinks about his fans. And from that comparison, she comes to the conclusion that maybe it makes more sense not to read him. Um, she's comparing evidence, right? The people who say he is important, she thinks it doesn't make a lot of sense. The people who say that maybe his work is not that good, she thinks it makes a bit more sense. So comparing the two, she uh, believes that she does not need to read more. But I keep emphasizing this word, more. She has read some of DFW, right? She read a few stories. She read some, uh, some news, uh, journalism uh, articles. So she's not entirely depending on other people's opinions. And in fact, one key part of her argument is from a story that she herself has read about the character who says that he wants to quote unquote fuck the reader uh, as a kind of uh, relationship with a reader as a metaphor. It'd be you. Um, and so this is her answer. It's probably not worth reading him. And group three basically agrees, but they have one point that they disagree with the author. It is when the author is talking about DFW's personal history. Um, on page 146, uh, she mentions that DFW uh, used to behave poorly as a child. He has manic depression, alcoholism, these things. Uh, but group three says that this kind of argument is not exactly fair because we know that the author is a woman. And so we kind of expect that maybe she would react worse to um, poor behavior against women, or maybe she would highlight more of that behavior. Uh, and in fact, if we look at all of the other things that she says, right, depression, uh, like violence, drunkenness. Uh, it's not that unique, right? There are other writers and artists who also were not very good people, and yet uh, most of us still think that they are important. But uh, the author actually does talk about this. On page 146, near the, near the beginning of the last paragraph, or I guess the end of the previous paragraph, After all, our favorite book lists are bound to include the works of rogues, misogynists, and manipulators of all genders and orientations. What this sentence says is, uh, as I just said, DFW is not the only terrible person to be a writer that some people think is important. He's not the only terrible person to be a so-called great artist. And the author says this, right? She says this is not unique to him. So why does she mention all of this? Um, and later in the essay, a bit later, like the next page, is where she brings up how DFW thinks about his own writing through the words of one of his characters. And she also explains why she thinks of that character as representing the author, because uh, DFW himself said that uh, that character was uh, very much like his own thinking. Um, so the logic of the argument is there, but group three is saying that the presentation of this argument seems to create a bias against DFW by first hitting us with all of the sensational stuff and only later quietly explaining why she does this, she gives us a subjective impression that this is not a good guy. Uh, and then uh, maybe at this point we have not noticed that at this point there is still no connection between the personal life and the work of the writer. That only comes later. Uh, is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah, yeah okay, thank you. 
Um, so to sum up group three, they agree with the author basically. Um, but they think that the argument could have been organized better. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, do other groups want to add to this question? OK, I think this is a very interesting experience because we're talking about not reading something. And most of you do not read it. Um, so hopefully through this discussion, you can have a better sense of how to uh, intentionally not read something or to decide whether something is worth reading or not worth reading. Because in the future, I'm sorry to say you're going to read a lot of things, whether in the next year of college or uh, in your workplace or like when you have to deal with the law, whether with, with the cops or with like inheritance or taxes, you're going to have to read a lot of things. So how do you choose what are the important things to spend your time on? Uh, that's something that we should all think about um, when we encounter these kinds of situations. OK, do you have questions about this essay? Yes. Uh, as, the, uh, as the teacher says in our, in our group, you mentioned about uh, motivation, right? So motivation to reading. So I think that maybe the right, the, the, the author, you want to put more emphasis on the motivation to, to read. You can, you, you have time to read it whatever you like, but you cannot just read out of the peer pressure or the pressure from the authorities, right? Yeah. Thank you, yes. Most of you uh, read what I tell you to read because I tell you that there's going to be an exam and you need to read this in order to get a good grade and get the credits and graduate. That does not make it fun to read what I give you, right? It just makes it something you have to do. Um, but I'm sure you have all had the experience of like, maybe you're like flipping through uh, YouTube or Netflix and you see something maybe that looks interesting and you start watching and you can't stop. It's so good. You, you don't go to sleep, you don't eat, you don't take a shower until you're finished. You skip classes, although you might skip classes for any number of reasons. Um, that kind of interest is what can help get you through something that's hard to understand. Um, and so that's also why people sometimes make uh, movies or shows about things that are not easy to understand or things that are not easy to talk about. Because if it's entertaining, if they can make you want to keep watching, then you might slowly understand. Um, so yes, I agree, you should only uh, or I guess you should not force yourself to read something that you don't want to read unless there's a very good reason, right? Uh, another way to say this is if the first episode of the TV show is bad, you don't have to wait for the second episode, right? It's just a waste of your life. I say this as someone who has suffered through seven episodes of She-Hulk and I'm still going. Um, so does that answer your question? OK, thank you. Do you have uh, other questions, other ideas? OK, let's talk about the next unit. Oh, wait, before that, I want to give you a hint about the midterm exam. The midterm exam will have two questions, one question for each unit. The first unit, essays. And the question for this unit will be related to Popular art or serious art? Low art or high art? OK, let's take a look at the next unit. Um, I'll hand out the handouts.
for the next, I think, three weeks, we're going to be reading a play. And the title of this play is The Woman in the Window by Alma de Groen. Uh, it was first performed in 1998. So let's talk about plays. We read plays like we read anything else, but in fact, plays are different from anything else because plays can be performed. This is a record of a performance, or you can say this is a blueprint for a performance. But the real essence, the real spirit of a play is what you see on stage. For many reasons. Um, when we read something, we have different ideas about that thing. We have different ways to understand the same thing. This is even more true for a play. When it, uh, for example, on the next page, you have a list of characters. But the only thing that it says is the age. Anna Akhmatova, 62. Rachel Sekharov, early 20s. The age of the people. So from the names, we can tell if they're men or women, mostly. Some, some of them we can't tell. And from the number, we can tell their age. But what do they look like? What kind of clothes do they wear? How do they move on uh, in space? How do they interact with other people? How do they talk? How do they dance? How do they sing? How do they cry? It depends on the specific performance. These are things that we cannot see, we cannot read from the page. And then at the bottom of this same page, it says setting. Leningrad in the early 1950s and Australia, a future. These, these two places are where the story happens. But again, what does that look like? If you imagine a stage, how do you make it look like Leningrad? Leningrad. How do you make it look like the future in Australia? When characters enter the stage, where do they come in? Can you see the doors? How is the space separated and divided? How, do, how does the play move from one setting to another setting? It's the same space. So how do you change places? What colors of light are on the stage? What does the background look like? Are there sounds? Are there background sounds? Is there music? What is the floor made of? Is it wood? Is it carpet? Is it metal? Is it plastic? All of these things depend on specific performance. So when we read a play instead of watching a play, we miss out on a lot. But the one thing that we don't miss out on is the relationship between the characters. Because no matter what the actors look like, no matter what they wear, no matter what they sound like, no matter how they move, they have to say what is on the page. So what is on the page is the one thing that is always the same, no matter which performance you watch. So in fact, when we read a play, we're actually putting on a performance each of us in our own heads, a, a different performance. And I think that's kind of fun. Um, but even when we read a play, when we read silently, it can be different from when an actor performs a play because each line can be performed in many different ways. For example, uh, on, on the next page, in the middle, Lily has a line. She says, I'm perfectly willing to sit out on the stairs, Anna. There are many different ways to say this. I'm perfectly willing to sit out on the stairs, Anna. Maybe you aren't willing, but I am. 
I'm perfectly willing to sit on the steps, Anna. I don't have to stand. Sitting is fine. I'm perfectly willing, uh, willing to sit out on the stairs, Anna. You don't have to let me in. I'm willing to sit outside. Or even something like, I'm perfectly willing to sit on, on the stairs, Anna. Which means she's not willing at all. So even this one sing, uh, single sentence can have many different meanings, even the opposite meaning, depending on how you read the sentence. So that's something we can always pay attention to. How, uh, what meaning does each line try to convey? Are we reading it in the way, in a way that makes sense? Okay, so do you have questions about plays? Um, the last time I taught a play, I asked students to do a simple performance, but nobody wanted to do that, so whatever. Um, this play is kind of special because it is a historical play, but it's also a science fiction play at the same time. There are two settings, right? One is in the 1950s, the other is in a future. Usually in English we say the future, but here it says a future. Uh, and you will discover that this is because it is not a good future. So perhaps the author is warning us that we should try to avoid this kind of future. Um, right, the play is about Anna Akhmatova, who is the woman in the window. And she's famous as a Russian poet. So in fact, one of the main themes of this play is the power of literature. Before next week, your homework is to read up to Act 1, Scene 12. Demo surging. This is on page 16. So you have to read up to the end of scene 12. So read up to page 19. It, it goes by very fast because it's a play. There's a lot of empty space. Right, so please read up to the end of page 19. See you next week.